I'm a refugee from Africa. I'm from the Republic of Congo. I stayed six years, six years in the camp, Kakuma refugee camp. My names are Crispin Musubaho Baseka Bakwa. So <laughs> it's like a book. <laughs> so before we get to the story, um, what is your favorite food since coming to America? Oh, I've discovered so much in Africa. In America, when it comes to food, first of all, I really enjoyed um, how do you call it? This is uh, pizza. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was my first favorite favorite food. And then I discovered hamburger. I remember I went to a hotel with um, Tom. Yes. Yeah. And I discovered hamburger. It was so nice. To a restaurant. Yeah. A restaurant. And uh, it's, it's yesterday. Jenny took me to a Mexican uh, grill. I Chipotle. really enjoyed that one. It is good. It is. Uh, I found it very, very nice. Next question. And this is a uh, fun question. What is your favorite football team? Yeah. I like Manchester. Manchester United is a football team. Manchester yeah. United. Yeah. Manu. Manu. So of course football, not football. Because what do we? What do you call American football? Uh, handball. Handball. That's right. <laughs> it's handball. It's not football. <laughs> so okay. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a few kind of fun things. We've we've enjoyed getting to know each other over the week, and so that, those are a few things that we laughed at. Uh, was handball. He watched. A rerun of the Steelers Bengals game at the children's home yesterday, some part of it. And uh, he was he he enjoyed it, but he said, That's rugby. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay. So um, let's get into the story though. Why don't you go ahead and just tell us kind of the overall story of how you became a refugee. Oh, thank you. It's a long story. And uh, the question which comes to my mind uh, first of all is why? Why should innocent people suffer? Why should it, why why should innocent people suffer? Surely people are suffering because of war. War is not good. War can make people separate from their families, from their loved one, from their uh, from their land, from the countries. That's why I can find myself here. I find myself in America from Africa. I never thought of being uh, an American, but here I am. So you can say it is because of war, but on this side, I've discovered America. I'm li I, I'm, I like it. I'm happy with it. And uh, so far, I really like the smile faces of Americans. <laughs> but back to my story is that uh, uh, Maybe from the map. This is where. Can you read Kanya Bayonga? Kanya Bayonga is a place whereby I I grew through. I grew from. I was born very far, deep in uh, in Ruchuru, somewhere here, near Goma. Goma is here. I was born somewhere here, some kilometers from Goma, in the North Kivu. You know, we are in Africa now. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I grew in Kanyabayonga. My father is a medical doctor. He used to work as a medical practitioner in Kanyabayonga. And as you, as you can see, Kanyabayonga is is um, bordering. It's near. It's not far from from Rwanda. You can see Rwanda is here. Goma, Rwanda. So, Kanyabayonga is somewhere here near Rwanda. So, you may find that in, in the world, <coughs> the neighboring country, just at the border, you may find some uh, Rwandese who are living here and some Congolese here. So, we share the border with, between the Congo and Rwanda. And just there at the border, you find Rwandese living in Congo. Congolese living in Rwanda. 
according to our constitution in Congo, once you stay for more than uh, 10 years in Congo, you, are, you have the right to become a Congolese. You can be given a citizenship. I don't know what, uh, if it applies in America. I don't know how long will I stay in America in order to qualify to be given a, a, an American nationality. I find out. <laughs> so, I grew here. My father used to have a, a clinic, medical clinic. Rwandi, we, I, stay, I, I, I grew with Rwandese. I was having even my girlfriend who was from Rwanda when I was a student, when I was a, at high school. So you understand that Rwandese and Congolese used to stay together. And now, um, this is in 1997, the, uh, the politics, politics changed. And uh, we started now experiencing some wars because some people were not happy with the government which was at place, the Mobutu regime, Mobutu Seseseko, he was a dictator and some politicians were not happy with it. And then these people, the politicians came up with uh, uh, some rebel, rebel groups in order to over, overthrow the, 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 the government of Mobutu, who was the dictator. So they started uh, torturing the Rwandese. It was a kind of segregation, uh, kind of, of um, uh, segregation. Rwandese were much discriminated and they were asked to go back to their country. Go back to your country. This is Congo for Congolese. It, we don't like Rwandese in our, in our country. So you understand that once you have, over, you have overstayed in a, a country for more than 10 years, you have invested in uh, business, housing, farming and so on, and you are told to go back to your country, it is, it is shocking. So most of these Congo uh, Rwandese were resisting, do not be, uh, uh, accept to go, just like, like that. So since these are the rebels, the rebel group, they were called Mai Mai. This was the name of the rebels. They are even now, they are still there in Congo. They are called Mai Mai. Now in Swahili, Mai means water and uh, Mai means water. So these people, they believe that once they pour a water on themselves, so the bullet cannot catch them. They are bulletproof. And uh, we really, we, we are, we, I was uh, very, I was, I lived it and uh, I experienced it. For sure, these people, the rebels, were bulletproof. It is magic, we cannot understand, we cannot believe it. But it is a true story. So these people do not use guns. This rebel group do not, uh, do not uh, use guns. They only use pangas, knives, such kind of uh, weapons. And these weapons uh, are the uh, are the weapons which were used to torture and to kill the Rwandese who are resisting to go back to the country. I was working with my father in the clinic. I went through some practical, uh, some, um, some 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 practicals as far as medic medicines concerned. I can I could treat. I could help. I could help my father in the clinic to do s uh, some treatment. So we used to welcome the Rwandese who are very much uh, injured uh, by the Mai Mai group, uh, group of rebels, and. Uh, we did a great job because uh, we only registered one case of uh, one couple. It was just a husband and wife and one child who were very much injured. They came to our clinic 
and uh, they are very much injured at the extent that they died even in our clinic. So they left behind a daughter, their lovely daughter, by names of uh, Jacqueline. So Jacqueline uh, was an orphan, an orphan left behind, and uh, we just, I just took that uh, daughter, Jacqueline. I took her to my house, and we adopt, we adopted her. Now, uh, uh, having that said, the rebels who are from my tribe, I'm from a tribe uh, here in the North Kivu, which is called Ira, the Ira tribe. Now, they were against my family and my father. They are against what we did in helping the Rwandese in treating their wounds, in uh, giving them uh, hope of life, because after treating them, they could not continue, proceed with their journey up to Rwanda. So you understand that we became enemies to those in uh, my, my group, because we are happy, we are uh, befriending their enemies. So Rwandese are enemies to my Mai rebels, and now, us, despite our, 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 our culture, now since we are helping the Rwandese, we are treating them, we are giving them medication, so we became enemies to our own people, the era. Now, this became a very serious situation whereby we were asked to go also, also to also go with those Rwandese because we are helping them, we are uh, uh, like uh, uh, taking side and opposing the plan of the Maimai. We became enemy that way and uh, I remember one day the Maimai came to our, our clinic warning us that we, have been, we are uh, helping their enemies and for that matter we will have to go with them. I thought, okay, we thought it was a joke, but these people were serious. And one day, they, I was with my father to the, in the clinic, and uh, uh, my mom, my mom okay, I remember it was a morning whereby the rebel came to, to the home. My mom was there. Thank to God, she managed to, to escape. And these people put our house to fire, just to show us that they, are, they, they, they were serious. They were serious that we, we have to, to move with the Rwandese, since we are helping the Rwandese. Now, mom escaped and came to the clinic, uh, telling us that they were, my mom have come home to, my, to our home, and they are uh, looking for us, they want to kill us. So we have to flee. We flee with my mom and father to the school to collect the children. And we went up to, to the farm. We had a lot of farms. My father had invested too much in the farm, in farming. And uh, wherever, wherever, whenever we had uh, clashes, ours was just to flee in the, in, in the farms because they could get something to eat and uh, set a shelter, a temporary shelter quickly. So that's how we escaped. We escaped uh, the Maimai in Kanyabayonga. So we fled to at about um, 30 kilometers from Kanyabayonga in a place called uh, Busekera. Busekera is a place where we had a very big farm Sekera. Yeah. It is a, a place where we used to farm and um, we fled with um, some med medicines because my father is a, is a doctor. So there we had also to, to set another dispensary kind of. We stayed there for one year when another 
another clash uh, came about between another group of rebels. So in Congo, we had two groups of rebels. The Mai Mai, who are Congolese, and also the Indera Hame, from Rwanda. Remember, during, during the genocide, Rwandese took refuge in the Congo. That is in 1994. Have you, heard, have you ever heard of genocide? Mm -hmm. Yes, in Rwanda. Man killing man. And uh, it was horrible in Rwanda. So they fled to Congo, whereby uh, these are the people who came to Congo with their guns. It's uh, a, milita a military group called uh, Interahamwe, which belonged to, Rwanda, to, to the Rwanda uh, country. Now it fled to Congo in 1994, and Congo has a very huge forest. They just went up to the forest and settled there in the forest. So these are the people who used to cause to, to kill people. They just come from the forest, they come to this town and start to kill people, to, to grab properties, money, belonging to the people. They kill, they rape women, they do what, uh, any kind of, uh, of harm to, to people. Then they go back again to the forest. That's another way for the rebels to keep themselves uh, going on, because uh, that way they can get money, they get uh, something to to sponsor to sponsor themselves, so that they may plan on how they can go and fight back in their country. So these two groups the group of rebels from Rwanda and also from Congo were at, uh, they were always fighting because from this group from Rwanda, the Intera Hamwe, were fighting the Mai Mai because first of all, the Mai Mai were resisting against their plan. They did not want uh, their culture of raping, stealing from people, killing people. So they had to fight them. Also, Intera Hamwe were against the, the Mai Mai because these people are chasing away the Rwandese from Congo to go back to their country. So they are always in co confrontation. And uh, one day we were in Busekera and then the war started. The war, uh, the, the war uh, between the two rebel groups, one from Congo Mai Mai and the other one from Rwanda, the Intera Hamwe, Intera Hamwe from Rwanda. Uh, they, 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 was, they, 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 they fought, and uh, that is now in Busekera where we are with my family, relatives. That is a very horrible situation which I, uh, I experienced since in my life, whereby I could see bullets going just on top. I could see God myself because the way I escaped that, I can't tell, it's like, uh, huh? I was like, uh, am I, Am I dying or am I still living? That way I could not even find my people. I went away and find myself alone. Where's my father? Where's my mother? Where's my, my children? Where's my wife? I couldn't see because it was uh, really terrible. So that way you just escape and uh, you don't you just think about other people later on when you are very far in the same place. But good enough, I managed to see my father and the small daughter Catherine, uh, and we proceeded on foot, trying to look for safe, uh, for a safe place where I can stay. We could escape the war. Now my father was very anxious because 
he couldn't see, he couldn't know. We, okay, we just asked three. I, my father, and Catherine. Now, where are the rest? Now, that was the question, my big question mark to, to us. And my father, being a responsible parent, he told me to proceed with the journey. So we, were, we could go from Kenya, uh, from Musekera. Musekera was uh, somewhere like here. So for us, we came from this point. We were going to Mutembo. Mutembo is here in the north. So I was left with the Catherine, and we proceeded on foot up to Mutembo. It is uh, almost 100 kilometers. Almost 100 and 70 kilometers. So we could walk with Jacqueline, and Jacqueline was about 11 years old. So sometimes Jacqueline could be uh, tired. I carry her on my back. We go, we are hungry, there's no food, people are, are not on the way, they have fled because of the war, we are just walking, fearing of getting, of meeting these bad people. We are stressed. So, I remember one day, uh, Jacqueline was very hungry, and I just, we just sat down and think of what to do. Okay, something, come, something came to my mind, and I went to the valley, in the valley, because our, our country is mountains, valleys. So I went to the valley and found sugar cane. And I just came with some sugar canes. I gave to, to Jacqueline, and I took some, just to gain our strength. We got some energy, and we went and proceeded with our journey. It's a sad story. When I start uh, telling my story like this, I pray God that I may, I may not cry, but it is sad, really. Especially, that is the moment I really suffered in my life. You are walking, knowing not where, where are you going, what is next, whom are you meeting with on the way, are, will, we, will we survive or are, are we dying? So you are stressed and you, you have to go on. So, with a little child again, who needs to, to, to be supported. Okay, we went with Jacqueline, and I don't know why. Uh, I was so much courageous, because Jacqueline was not my, my, my direct daughter. But I was very, my love, I, I, I loved her very much. She was very much closer to me. I forgot about the others. I just proceeded with Jacqueline. And I was praying God that we, we, we are alive. If others have died, now let us survive at least with, them, with Jacqueline. I really uh, thank God that we went. We took, uh, at night, we just slept yeah, outside in the bush. Then we proceed again, you know, 100 kilometers on foot. Now from here, the table on foot. Me was tired. Jacqueline was tired. And I was targeting Mutembo because in Mutembo, my aunt is, was working there, was there, would belong to a religious congregation, religious convent. So I went to Mutembo and uh, I went to the religious nun, uh, the convent. I got my aunt there, and I suggested to her that we may stay with her in the in their convent. She said it's okay. Now, that was my my first my first sigh, uh, as if you are burdened, and somebody comes. And remove the burden on your, on your shoulder. How do you feel? You feel like <sighs> it was my first sigh. And uh, I was there one day, one night, 
with Jacqueline and my aunt. We, are, we were given the first uh, uh, the, the food and uh, some food, some water to drink. We felt okay. But may I, I told my aunt that, okay, this is a religious, a re religious congregation, a religious convent, whereby uh, women are only allowed to stay here. How will I be here? And I'm a man. I don't feel comfortable here. I better look for a better place to stay. So I just told her that I better go to the neighboring country. So we are here. I just uh, I was here, and I told my aunt that I'm going here at the border because I'm not secure here. At least my my my, my adopted daughter was secured in the, in the convent. It is, uh, okay, sometimes these rebels can come to the conference and wreck the nuns. They don't bother, they don't, uh, they don't mind. But for me, my, for my safety, and since Jacqueline was very tired, she remained with my aunt there in Butembo. May I, I proceeded with my journey. I crossed the border here. I'm just, uh, just at the border, there is a, a parish, a parish for, Catholic, Catholic Christians, where my spiritual father was staying, was working there as a missionary. And uh, I just went there. He welcomed me in the parish. I told him about the story, about what is happening in Congo. He was sympathizing with me. And he told me that the place was not secure. So it was not safe to stay there since these people from Congo. Uh, go to Uganda easily. It is just at the border of Congo, and sometimes if it is the, the, the rebels come up to up to Uganda. So since those rebels know me very well, Father, at uh, in Uganda, that missionary uh, saw that it was uh, genius to think of going to Kenya. I told him, I'm very tired of walking. How will I make it to Kenya? He said, okay, no problem. I have friends who, have, who are drivers. They are driving to the truck, the truck which uh, carries carry timber from Congo. And a driver took me from Uganda to Kenya. And uh, while in Kenya, I stayed I stay in Nairobi, the capital city of Kenya. I managed to to gain a living for one year in Nairobi, because I could teach, I was a teacher in the six schools in Nairobi, whereby I was teaching French to the Kenyans. So I, I was like a, a bit enjoying life in Nairobi until when the government of Kenya uh, ordered that nobody, no refugee, should found here in Nairobi. Nairobi is here. So the government wanted all refugee, all refugees to go and, and stay here in, in Kakuma refugee camp in the northern eastern part of Kenya. So I came from Nairobi, I went from Nairobi to Kakuma refugee camp. And from there, uh, I, I was missing my family. I was missing my family too much. My members of the family, I was missing my father, my wife, my children, Jacqueline herself. So, and again, what I, I hate so far from the camp is that uh, no communication so far. We couldn't communicate, no internet. But now, uh, six years in the camp, UNHCR, United Nations for the High Commissioner for Refugees was taking care of us and uh, arranging for our our our, our, our um, resettlement. So some people go to England, others to America, others to Australia, Norway. I don't know 
Amsterdam or Holland or Switzerland. Yes, for a settlement. So myself, I was, I was lucky to come to America. My, my country of choice was America. If you ask me why, I say it's because I want to be great in my future. I want to be a superman, like the way America is a superpower continent. So that when I go back home, I may go and bring some changes to this huge country, which is still at war, which is still backwards because of war. You believe with me that whenever there is war in a country, nothing good can go, can go, nothing good can go on. So our country is like that. It is uh, unfortunate. A very big country, very rich. It's, it's there that you can get any type, any species of animals, lions, cheetahs, leopard, okapi, I don't know, zebra, name it there. The resources, gods, diamonds, and so on and so on, everything is there. And the land is fertile. It rains all the time. It's like uh, in South Carolina, nowadays it's raining. <laughs> That's not the condition. In, in Congo, it's because of the forest we have. And, uh, so that's how uh, my story goes, and uh, so that's, why, that's how I came to this end. So real fast, I want to clarify a couple things. So first of all, when you said America is a superpower, there's one thing that I didn't realize, and I don't think you realize, about being an American, and the fact that it's a superpower in the, grand, in, in the whole world, if any of us travel anywhere in the world and something happens to us, America comes after us. America will pursue, like if somebody takes us or somebody harms us or somebody does anything to us, our country has our back. It's not like that in Congo. If, if a Congolese travels to Europe and somebody harms that Congolese, the Congolese government they they don't even notice. They don't know. They don't even like. They don't even like to know whether whether you are somewhere. So you just die like a fly like that. Nobody cares. So here's here's the thing about Crispin is after about five years of being in America, if he goes through the process, green card and you know all the immigration process, he will become an American citizen, which means when he goes back to Congo, he will have power because they can't if they harm him. America will step in, yeah, on his behalf, yeah. and and so and so he wants to study. He wants to. You want to go to law school, yes, uh, so that he can learn law and so they can uh, go back to Congo. Uh, he's very hopeful uh, to find his family still. Um, his wife, his three children, his adopted daughter Jacqueline, his father, um, and he's also very hopeful to to go over there and make a difference because when he goes back, he will be an American citizen and he'll have power that he didn't have when he was there before. And so um, that's a great thing. There's one more thing I want to get, and we, we're running out of time, but you said this to me today when you were telling me, and I just, I got to pull this out of you. I got to, I got, they need to hear this. So when you were walking up to Butembo, yeah. uh, after that horrible day when you were on the farm and, and war broke out and you guys scattered, uh, you had this desire, part of you had this desire to go back and, and fight uh, because of what those yep. rebels had done to you, yep. but you told me that something reminded you mm -hmm. that that wasn't the way to treat them. So, can you, do you remember what, what we were talking about? Yeah, I remember. I remember telling you that something, okay, you know, when this happened to me, um, I was very much uh, uh, traumatized and very much angry because my question was why are, why am I suffering why and I was like uh, go and revenge go and revenge my, my, my uh, okay fight, fight for my right my right to life taking a gun and also revenge but something came to my mind of um, uh, you remember the, in the Bible it's written that you should forgive even your enemy. You should love even your enemy the way you love yourself. Love God and love your enemy. 
that is Jesus who was uh, advising us, teaching us, telling us to love even the enemy. And this is the time I could get even the definition of, of, of what it means by love. Because it's not easy. I found myself in a situation whereby I'm challenged to love even those people who are like killing my family members. That I should love them. I should pray for them so that they may come back to God. Because remember, God is the one who created even these people who are, harm, who are, who are harming me. So I was uh, like uh, defining love. That's when I can tell you I got the true definition of love. Because you know, I'm walking quiet, and now many things come to my mind about this uh, enemy's love and so on. Now, I found that love is not what people think about. You know, let me say I love you. I love you. Now, why do you love me? You may ask me. Why do you love me? So, somebody who does not know the definition of love, the, the way I define it, I defined it that day, and you will, you will agree with me that it's the perfect definition of love. Many people, especially the teenagers, will say, I love you because you are beautiful, you are handsome, and therefore, I want to sleep with you. I want to have sex with you. That's, what I, that's why I love you. But now, me, I found another definition of love that is the perfect definition. That love is a sacrifice. Why is it a sacrifice? Because it's not easy to love the enemy. Imagine somebody ha having killed your father and mother using a, a knife or a panga. And then here you are asked, you are asked to love that person. It's not easy. It is, that, that's why I'm saying it's a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. You sacrifice yourself. And that's why Jesus loved us. He loved us. He sacrificed himself in himself for us. So I was challenged that day to love even these people who are uh, torturing innocent people. That's what I learned from that's, that. You know, we talk in here all the time about love and loving your enemies. And to us, our enemies are like people that make fun of us at school or people that cut us off at a red light. But Crispin, you've experienced a true enemy and, and I can't imagine how hard that was. But I think the only way you could do that was through the power of Christ. Yeah. Through, you know, the fact that you're a Christian, that you've given your life to Christ and you understand that Christ did the same thing. That's awesome. But we want to pray for you. And then we'll wrap up and we'll, we'll close. And uh, sorry that we had to cut some of your story short. There's so much more that he told me that I wanted him to be able to tell you, but we only have so much time. But uh, but Crispin plans to be with us. He wants to worship with us and be here on Sunday and all that. So get to know him, and you can ask him you know, your, his, more of his story later if you want. Uh, it's, a, it's a powerful story. And I look forward. I, I told this to you, but I want to say it in front of them. I look forward to the day where you get to go back there. And, and I believe... I know you believe that one day you're going to reunite with your wife and your children and, and you're going to see them and, and I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to, to watch that happen. So uh, let's, let's, let's pray for you, Christian.